Welcome to Liberating Faith Podcast. I'm so glad that you have tuned in to listen. I'm Dr. Michael Stenhammer, and I have studied the Word of Faith movement for a number of years. I was part of it. I've done a lot of research, and I want to share some thoughts and insights here that might be of help to you. So listen in and see what you think. So welcome to this new episode. I want to talk about five questions that I received from someone who wants to move from the Word of Faith. They are, uh, you know, they grew up in the movement. They've been a leader in the movement. He's even serving as a pastor in a church. And they sent me these five questions and I wanted to interact with them because I think these questions are very relevant and they hit things or bring out things that I think many of us have been asking ourselves. And even if you are not transitioning out of the word of faith, uh, maybe friends or other people around you that might ask these questions. And even if you come from other backgrounds, right, these questions are relevant in any theological transition, in any move. So I, I thought these were really helpful and that might be a blessing to you. So let's start. The first question is this, that I grew up in the movement. Uh, I've never been exposed to any other kind of theology or Christian uh, group. Do I need a complete renovation of my worldview? So the question then is basically, I mean, do I need to exchange my whole worldview? Do I need to rethink everything? Is I mean, what's truth kind of thing? And my answer is yes and no. There is a need of change, radical change. Okay, but there are also things that are really worth holding fast to. So I would say that, yes, a renovation of the worldview is needed, but not an exchange of worldviews. So if we look at the first thing, what, what are needed to be changed? The first thing I would say is you need to change the overall story. So I've I done several podcasts on this and YouTube videos. And so I'm not going to get into details here, but I just want to emphasize that theology is not a system of just ideas that are, you know, strung together in, you know, even word of faith is not a system. Word of faith teachers believe that it is a system, but it's a story. So the first thing you, you have to understand is this, that the word of faith is inviting us into a world that is shaped by a larger story or meta narrative or grand story or whatever you want to call this. But you have to understand how it is, how it functions and what needs to be changed in it. So the first thing that needs to be, uh, you know, I would really encourage you is to own uh, you know, story and also see what, how much of that have you absorbed? I mean, not everyone in the word of faith has really absorbed the word of faith story. You might, when you look at, you look at this, you might say, well, I have actually filtered things. I have not embraced this whole story. So, well, that's good then. So, and, and again, one of my main points of the story, it, that is the, pro the problem in the word of faith understanding is that it's, it's a reverse story. It's going back to Eden, that Jesus came to restore everything that Adam lost. And now we are restored to that place of dominion and ownership or, or blessing and all that. And we can operate on God's level and things like that. Well, the problem with that story is that that's not a forward looking story, which is the biblical eschatological story. The biblical story is that Jesus did not just come to restore what Adam lost, which is true, but in a different interpretation then, of course, but still that it's a forward looking that it's, it's, it's going to uh, the marriage of heaven and earth and that we will be part of God's new world and sharing God's life and all these things. And that is a radically different understanding of things. So, and even perspectives I speak about the kingdom of God, the now and the not yet, that we cannot expect the kingdom of God and the blessings of the kingdom of God in fullness here. We don't have that as a right or a privilege because the kingdom of God has not yet fully arrived. So to understand some of these perspectives of the story, I think are extremely important. And I would encourage anyone that that needs to change. And that change takes some time, but it's very important. The other thing is uh, what we can call, you know, the, the, what the word of faith people speak about as spiritual laws, that the whole understanding of the world, the, the cosmology, understanding of how the world operates is that it operates by certain spiritual set laws that are absolute. It's an act consequence theology. So just know these laws and work them and you will see the benefit of them. That is not a biblical understanding of things. 
And, and first of all, it doesn't allow room for the Holy Spirit. It doesn't allow room for the sovereignty of God. And it creates a lot of other issues. And I've done several videos on spiritual laws so that you can listen into them. But I would say it's very important to, to deconstruct the whole idea of spiritual laws. You can keep some spiritual principles and, and there are some truth in there as well. But that basic understanding that there are spiritual laws out there and you just need to learn them and operate with them. That's not biblical. That's something that needs to be renovated or changed in the worldview. Another issue that you need to address in your worldview is the image of God. See, every theological story, every tradition, or some people are afraid of the word tradition. What I mean by that is the theological group you're in, your, your, you know, your crew, <laughs> you know. And if you come from the Word of Faith crew, uh, you have a certain image of God. A certain way you think God is and how God operates. And one of the most central things in the Word of Faith is the image of God as good. It's the first stepping stone in anything. God is good, which is very biblical, very true. The only problem is that the Word of Faith puts their own definition of goodness within that definition. So it, because God is good, He doesn't want me to, to lack or suffer anything. So that means that I have the right not to suffer in this life or things like that. So the image of God in the Word of Faith is actually something that you have to look at very carefully. And, you know, and still keep a biblical understanding of God is God is fully and purely good. He's after our eternal good. That is the key point. And the problem, though, is that the word of faith puts their own definition of what good means. And then they end up in, in quite significant troubles. So even, uh, you know, the idea that God is limited to our faith, things like that, that God has faith. God is a faith God. Um the reading will mark 11, 22, that God has the God kind of faith. All, all those things are actually limiting who God is. And even the spiritual laws, that God acts by spiritual laws. Uh, th those are problems in the image of God that actually need to be uh, addressed. So uh, I, I would just uh, encourage anyone to look at how, how is God portrayed within the word of faith and how is God portrayed in the Bible. And that will make a difference in, in that. And also Jesus. Who is Jesus in this worldview of the word of faith? Well, Jesus, of course, he is. I mean, you, you, you give credit to him for being the son of God and all that. So it's not a, a denying of the divinity of Jesus or, or his humanity or things like that. But still, Jesus does not is not allowed the full center stage uh, within the word of faith worldview. Jesus is not the central figure. Uh, you might say he is, and there are many who love Jesus very dearly, who preach about Jesus and so on. But there are parts of the worldview that puts Jesus on the side and the believer in the center. And to sideline Jesus with self, to sideline Jesus with the ego of the, the believer is a very dark side of the word of faith. So uh, uh, there needs to be a radical change in who Jesus is and his place in believers' lives, that he needs to be absolute king and is, he has to be the absolute centerpiece and that the Christian life is geared towards Jesus and into Christ-likeness. And that means that we take all the Gospels very seriously. They were not transitions. The Gospels were not written doing a transition period between the old and the new testament so that we now should just live in the in the in the writings or, or the epistles particularly paul that is a total misunderstanding uh the 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 gospels is about understanding who the king is and his kingdom and we should and i would encourage anybody who is transitioning out to spend your majority time in the gospels OK, so getting to know Jesus through the Gospels and, and the centrality of Jesus is absolutely essential to be Jesus centered, Christ centered. Uh, very, very important. And with that, as I just mentioned, comes a critique of our own self. We shouldn't look, uh, we shouldn't allow our own egos to play too big of a role in our understanding of things. But in the word of faith worldview, the believer's self and ego is unhinged or is un, uh, not unhinged, but un, unchecked. That's the word I was looking for. It's unchecked. 
uh, you're allowed to to work. I mean, the ego is not really critiqued because the word of faith says that you your spirit is fully born again and fully righteous. And it's just sin just exists in your soul uh, and in your in your body, in the flesh. So it's for your human spirit who is fully born again and fully righteous to keep those other, you know, dimensions of you being in check. Well, it, it that when when you speak like that, you lose a critique of self. And what happens is when the self is not critiqued, then it becomes free to to somehow convert re the rest of theology to be self-serving and egocentric. So the problem with the word of faith is that it doesn't hold our egos, ourself, uh, to, uh, to a prophetic critique of, rep of, of daily repentance. Okay, so we need to come to a place where we are uh, continually repenting before the Lord uh, of our sins and aware that we are still a work in progress. We are not yet fully, um, you know, perfected, of course, but this is very, very important. Uh, and I speak to that at other places as well. And I, I, I don't mean to go full, you know, full speed back to some kind of, you know, uh, just we're unworthy worms and all this kind of stuff. I, I don't, that's not what the Bible teaches either, but we need to be able to keep two truths in our head at the same time. And that's, I am, I am, um, I'm born again, but at the same time, we're still affected by sin. So we need to, to, to be aware of that. So another point, point here is about the Holy Spirit. The Word of Faith emphasizes a lot on the Holy Spirit. Uh, we have, uh, in at least in the more classical Word of Faith camps, we got an emphasis on Holy Ghost meetings or Holy Spirit uh, revivals and things like that. There's an emphasis on spiritual gifts of prophecy, of all these good things. And, and those are important. But if you look more closely at the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, it is very limited. So I, I would encourage anybody who's on a journey uh, into sound and more biblical theology is to develop your understanding of the person of the Holy Spirit. So uh, and I, I just I did a, just a, the last podcast was on that. And I recommend some resources where you can go deeper in your understanding of the Holy Spirit, because the problem in the word of faith, not just the word of faith, but the word of faith clearly has the Holy Spirit only as helper. And that's very biblical. The Holy Spirit is our helper. The Holy Spirit is to, to help us. That's very clear in, in John. In John 14, 15, and 16, those chapters specific, specifically 14 and 16 in John, emphasizes the Holy Spirit being the paraclete or the, the helper. And, and that's very, very important. But that's not all the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is God, meaning, and of course, the Word of Faith also believed that He's God, but still they do not release the Spirit to be fully God in the sense of taking initiative, of being, uh, you know, the one who is uh, overseeing, of guiding, uh, not just guiding, but even controlling, uh, you know, things in the world. If you study the, the book of Acts, you'll find the Holy Spirit is the one taking initiative. Uh, so that the Holy Spirit is limited within the Word of Faith theology, actually. Even though they have an emphasis on the Spirit, it's still under the control of the, of the, the believer. The self is still unchecked, where, where we need to let the Holy Spirit be the third person of the Trinity and not limit the Holy Spirit. So I, I would definitely emphasize that as something else. Something else with it that needs to be renovated, addressed, or changed in the worldview is what we can call an instrumentalism. And I know that some of these words might sound really weird, like cosmology or instrumentalism. And, and, and you might think, why, why do you have to use all these difficult words? I don't find them to be, to be elitistic. I mean to use them as tools for thinking. And I believe all of you can appropriate these words and use them because they are there for us to use them and they are really helpful. So when I speak about instrumentalism, I speak about a mentality that everything is for you to use. Okay, so things are just there and you can use them to bring certain results. So you are there for your, you know, for a blessed life. So you look for things that you can use a pragmatic understanding that I can use this, apply them so that I can get to this point of blessing in my life. So the word of faith has this instrumentalized understanding of things. They use the word of God to get faith. They use the word of God to release healing. They use the name of Jesus to, uh, as a, a as a word as a you know a name of authority to to you know. So all these things become instruments that you use 
to to reach another you know level in the, your Christian life. The problem is when you instrumentalize things, when things become instruments for you to use, again you are the one using them. So you again become that ego who is sitting there with, with the Word of God so you can use it. You got spiritual gifts that you can use, you got authority, you got words that you can create with, you, you got the name of Jesus that you can use as an instrument. You got the anointing. Uh, you got the Holy Spirit as your helper that you can use. You, you know, you, you got the spiritual laws that you can use. So what happens in this instrumentalized worldview is that you become the boss with all these kinds of instruments ready for you to use. That's not the biblical worldview. Biblical worldview is you are invited into a relationship with God, a living relationship. A relationship is not instrumental. That means you cannot use God to get certain results. We, we, we come to know God and we give ourselves to God in a relationship of love and that things happen, of course, and God will bless us and there are many things happen, but we, we're not using the Word of God as an instrument. We're not using the name of Jesus just as an instrument. Even though we believe in the power in the name of Jesus and all these things, it's, it's a worldview change that we need where we are not the owners of these things. We are not, we are not using things as instruments, but we're welcomed into a living relationship which is different. And um, I, I speak about this in different places, but, and I might need to do some more on, on just unpacking what instrumentalism means. But I just want to note that for a fact that, or for, for a point, that that's something within the worldview that needs to be addressed. And also for sure, suffering and faith. Suffering and faith are two things that the word of faith really struggle with. First of all, faith, it, that we can measure faith. That faith is a force that you can use again as an instrument to see certain results. Well, faith in the Bible, and I've been speaking about this in other places, so I'm not going to speak about them here, but faith is relational. Faith is a relational entity. It's not an, an object in itself. It, it's not a force. It's not a power. Faith is trust in God. And that, that's a relational thing, right? So, so with that comes the idea that if faith is a force, if faith, if faith is something in and of itself, the faith of God that God also has, that means if you use it, you can see certain kinds of results. You can see financial breakthroughs. You can see uh, you know, health breakthroughs. And you can see growth in your personal life and your ministry and all these things. So faith equals a certain kind of outward signs. It will result in certain things. Well, that understanding of faith is not biblical. And what it does, first of all, is that we can measure somebody's faith by certain kinds of signs. That's not true. You, uh, some people's faith can result in, I mean, their trust in God, their walk with God can result in an outwardly blessed life. But we also know if study Hebrews 11, the faith heroes, they did not have any signs, some of them, that showed that they had that faith that, that, you know, that will bring that kind of flourishing in life. So we, we cannot measure somebody's faith by certain outward signs. Faith is measured by faithfulness to Jesus, no matter the outcome. Okay. Faith is measured. Biblical faith is measured by faithfulness to Jesus, no matter the outcome. So the, the whole idea in the word of faith worldview that you can measure it by certain things uh, it, it's just, it needs to be deconstructed because it is very unhealthy. It's unbiblical and it's not good for your spiritual health and growth. And that part of the worldview needs to go for sure. The reason why, one of the main reasons, first of all, of course, the image of God and things like that, but also because it doesn't leave any room for our human experience of suffering. If you study the Bible, Clearly, without any word of faith lenses on your nose, you know, you would see that the people of God will go through hardships. And when I say hardships, I do not just mean, uh, you know, persecution, uh, like what the word of faith allows, right? But all the other kinds of suffering as well, which we cannot explain, okay? And that doesn't mean that God has forsaken us and all that, but the word of faith has no theology that handles suffering in life. And of course, suffering can never be explained. Suffering will always be a mystery this side of God's new world. I'm not saying that there's any theology that can explain suffering. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not talking about explaining suffering. We cannot. Suffering is, at the end of the day, a mystery. 
What I'm saying is that the word of faith does not have the resources to help you when you go through suffering. That's when the word of faith turns dark and the word of faith turns on you instead. So in the worldview, there is no, there is no help to handle prolonged suffering. And this is where the worldview needs to change because the New Testament, I mean, the whole Bible has so many beautiful resources to help us in times of suffering and hardship. So those are the things that I would speak to. There are many other things, but those would be some of the main ones. Uh, and of course, we're talking about prosperity. Uh, you know, again, I'd be speaking about self selfishness. That um, you know, that we had to be very careful about those things. That prosperity does not enter in as a selfish ambition. Uh, or, you know, that eats you know our, away from you know the self giving and things like that. Uh, but of course, there are some parts here that are also helpful. So anyway, uh, coming back to so if these are some of the main points of critique within the Word of Faith, they are really serious now. I mean, these things are serious. The idea that you can create with your words, for example, and all these things. And even, uh, you know, that that in that story that Adam was created, uh, you know, sharing uh, the uh, the nature of God, you know, within the word of faith. So that's really not true. Uh, that That's not there. So there are things in the story that are really uh, not there and that can really cause us to enter in into some actual dark places. So those need to change but there are things that i would recommend that you do not discard things that that's why i'm, I'm thinking the, that the term worldview renovation is very helpful and not just a full exchange to something totally different because there are many things that you should hold fast to because there are much of good pentecostal uh, charismatic spirit-filled spirit-empowered theology whatever you want to call it renewal theology there's some really good stuff in the word of faith too that you might not get somewhere else that I would definitely keep. And maybe that's why God allowed you to come into this movement in the first place. I've been asking myself, why God would you have allowed me to go so deep and invest so much in this movement and then realizing that there were some major, major issues here? Well, because I realized that some of the things that I got were things I could not get anywhere else, at least not what I know. So uh, there are some things that are definitely worth holding fast to. And if you're interested in some of that, I would recommend listening to my video and, or reading my article, The 10 Gifts of the Faith and Prosperity Gospel, because then I mentioned 10 things that I think are really gifts within the Word of Faith. But first of all, hold fast to a focus on faith. Um, even though there are some, mis you know, there are misinterpretations about the nature of faith, there is still a very good emphasis on faith as trust. So, you know, that, that the word of faith has this emphasis on faith, that, that's really, really important. And that faith brings us into the synergy of, of, of the, the human, and, and human and God together, wor working together in, in a relationship of trust. That's powerful. And there are some amazing testimonies of faith in the word of faith that can really encourage us. So that keep that focus on faith. Just get rid of faith as being something in and of itself, a force and a power that is just there for you to use as an instrument. Get rid of that and keep faith as a trust, but still there's much to be thankful for and happy about. So keep the focus on faith because, uh, you know, Hebrews 11 uh, speaks about, you know, verse 6, that without faith, faith it's impossible to please God. So uh, that means in reverse that God is pleased with faith. So we, we definitely need to keep that focus and I'm very thankful for that. Uh, another thing I, I think is important is uh, that love for the Word of God. The openness that God is speaking through the Word, the Holy Spirit is using the Word of God to, to, uh, to mediate His presence into our lives, that we can get a now word for our lives, that even we can get um, the, what they call revelation knowledge, which is a bit problematic. Uh, and I just did a podcast on that too, but still just that expectation on the Word, uh, loving the Word, spending time in the Word, uh, getting to know God through the Word of God. There, there are many things of the focus on the Bible, which is beautiful, especially in a time where research is showing that we have an extreme illiteracy when it comes to biblical knowledge, where people are becoming biblically illiterate. So there is that uh, love for the word that that is really, really wonderful in the word of faith. And I would keep that for, you know, 
do it. Keep it. It's a beautiful gift to love the Word of God, to focus on the Word of God and, and to give time to the Word and so on. And another thing that I think is it's beautiful is, is uh, an, an attitude of generosity, uh, that there's a radical generosity within the Word of Faith. I, I say it over again. I never met as radically generous people as I do within the Word of Faith movement. And some say, yeah, 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 you know, it's just selfishness. They just give to receive. Well, I don't see that all the time. Yes, of course, there is that idea that I give to you now because I think you're good ground so I myself can get a better reward later on. Sure, there is the, that moment uh, you know, of selfishness, but not always. There's, there's some kind of very, uh, you know, a beautiful generosity that if you wash it, it, it's beautiful. And I would recommend or not recommend, I would command. I can't command, <laughs> but just encourage you keep to be a generous giver because most churches struggle with generosity generosity. Um, if you look at the statistics, I just heard recent statistics on uh, how little Christians actually give. It's in the U.S. It's, it's amazingly sad. So here, generosity is a beautiful thing. It's an expression of the love of God. Generosity is, is a direct expression of the spirit-filled life that is filled with the love of God because God is generous father and generous giver and all these things. So I think that that's a beautiful aspect. Also, an openness for the supernatural, that there's an openness for God to do the impossible. Okay, I think that that just that mind mindset or worldview that it's open for the miraculous in, in in breaking, if you want to use that term, of the Holy Spirit to do what is impossible. That that's beautiful, and that creates a sense of expectation and a sense of hope that even you might go through something like a sickness or a financial problem or a relational problem uh, or struggling with, you know, some something in your life, mental health or issues of, you know, substance abuse or whatever it is that I that that open worldview that for God, nothing is impossible and God can move any mountain. I, I think that openness and expectation is beautiful within the worldview. I would hold fast to that for life, all right? Because it's it's beautiful and it's wonderful. The last thing is that some depends on where you come from the Word of Faith movement, but many in the Word of Faith have a focus on mission of reaching the world with the gospel or reaching out with the gospel through various different kinds of means and outreaches. That's something I would definitely hold fast. Early Word of Faith teachings said even that prosperity was meant for mission. It was meant for, for the, the mission of God to really reach out into the world. That's a very powerful truth. So I would, I would hold fast to that truth of a missional, uh, a missional life, of a mission-centered life. And when I say mission, I don't mean just going to, you know, overseas to another nation or another culture. It, I'm meaning the, 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 the life that is outward looking. That is, is going into the world, uh, whether it be preaching the gospel, sharing resources, uh, you know, uh, be making signs for the kingdom of God. That, that kind of uh, just worldview that is reaching out into the world with the gospel, whether it be in words or in deeds, uh, you know, those kinds of things. So that's something I would hold fast to. So that's a, a long response to the question, do I need a complete renovation of my worldview? And, and my, my answer was yes and no. Okay, so my second point, or not the second point, this is the second question, and, and I have a few points to that. So the second question is, and don't worry, I'm not going to answer this long. You say, if there's five questions, this pod would be long. Well, I'm not going to be as long on the other ones. So uh, I think we will be able to keep this uh, to a regular time. But the second question that it was asked was, how do I make sense of the results I have gotten through the Word of Faith? Okay, I think this is a very important question. Because I also saw results. Many people I've spoken to, they don't leave the word of faith because they haven't gotten any results. They leave for other reasons. Because usually they have seen theological problems, problems with their teachings and or, or you know or practices or things like that. But many have seen amazing things within the word of faith. Uh, I even I got healed myself. Uh, I met my wife, which is the greatest gift within the word of faith. I, I, I've seen, you know, awesome miracles, uh, you know, and, and just uh, I received, you know, uh, 
gifts from the Spirit. Uh, I have been used in, in, in you know, by, by the Holy Spirit in, in different, uh, you know, wonderful ways. Things that I, I'm just so grateful for. And, and we even hear wonderful, uh, you know, miracles and things within the Word of Faith. So how do we make sense of these? And, and I'll have come back to that in different podcasts and videos. But how can I make sense of seeing um, great, great miracles while I acted like a fool? Uh, I, I spoke to somebody with a tumor in, on their throat, big as a mandarin. And I said, at my word, disappear. I didn't even, I don't think I even used the name of Jesus. I just said, at my word, be healed. And the tumor disappeared. And we were hundreds of people there. Uh, you know, it's documented somehow, somewhere. I don't know where the video is now. But but still, it's there. And, and it was my ego. But still, there was a miracle. So I've been struggling with things like that. Well, what about those things, right? So I'm gonna get, I, I can't settle this. I'm, I'm still there where I'm uh, negotiating these things, thinking about these things. But let me give you a few uh, thoughts. I just want to interrupt myself for a moment and invite you to watch some of the videos that I made on YouTube and also download some of the study articles that are written. You can find them on the website. Back to the message. First of all, I, I think, and even like I've seen miracles in my life and other people's lives when they have used positive confession, they have, you know, imagined, you know, an alternative reality and they have been confessing that to be the reality, uh, which is the teaching of confession, right? And, and then that happened. So now that seems like positive confession actually works. Yeah. So what, you know, and then you get teachings to say the positive confession, God, you know, doesn't work that way. You know, you cannot create with your words and still you have these amazing things happening. So how are you going to, what are you going to do, right? So what has helped me is to see it as ascribe every miracle that you have seen, every result that you have seen to the love and the grace of God. Okay, so don't ascribe them to a certain kind of practice or a certain kind of theology. Because in the word of faith worldview, when something happens, you, you accredit very often God, but also the system. The word works. So if a miracle has happened, I, I've seen this so many times. I read this. You can read about it. You can hear people say it. If somebody gets healed or you get a miracle, or, you know, you tell people, well, the word works. The word works. Well, yeah, but when you say the word works, you actually mean that the theological system of the word of faith works. You might, you know, no, that's not what they're saying. They mean that the Bible works or the spoken word works. Yes, but it's their interpretation of the Bible. It's, it's so these amazing miracles that they are experiencing, they become uh, proofs of the worldview. So like uh, one of the early Word of Faith guys uh, said that the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So the proof of the pudding is all in all these miracle stories. So they seem to kind of bring the, the you know, to, to mean that this is a true theological understanding. These are true interpretations of the Bible. So we had to move away from accrediting the theological system to glorifying God and seeing that whatever you experienced is not a, a um, confirmation of the worldview. It's a confirmation of who God is, His love and grace. So uh, the way I, I think about it is this, that you might have been confessing for healing, like I did. I was sick. Uh, I had a stomach disorder. And so I've been, uh, I was confessing, I'm healed. By stripes, I'm healed. By stripes, I'm healed. Uh, you know, these symptoms of sickness or have to go because I was healed on Calvary 2000 years ago. Healing is mine. And I spoke it and I declared it and I decreed it and I, you know, prophesied my future and all these things. Right. And um, finally, I actually got healed. Uh, and um, then for a long time, I used that as an example, a long time, but I used it as an example, at least for for positive confession that I was confessing my healing until it took place. But now I, I see it that God in his goodness and in his love, in what we can call the economy of God. He takes these confessions of his prideful people to be prayers. So when the response was a, a you know healing is not that I created healing by my faith, by my words and, and release my faith by my words so that the, the healing that is, is present in the spiritual became manifested in the natural. 
That's the word of faith understanding. That's not, I believe, how God looks at things. But he hears us walking around confessing. I confess this. I confess that. I speak this. I speak that. But when you do, God in his beautiful love, in his an amazing kindness and patience with us, takes these as prayers. And as prayers, God responds. So whatever you have experienced as results have been answers to prayer by the love and the grace of God. So that means we can glorify God for the results that you have received in the word of faith without that crediting the word of faith worldview. And the same thing is, I mean, you can experience, uh, you know, miracles and experiences with God, even in other, uh, you know, uh, theological groups or, you know, things like that. And that doesn't mean still that all their theology is right. It confirms who God is, the love of God, the grace of God. So that's how I would do it. I would not go into the loop uh, of starting to think, was it the devil? I, I know an evangelist who was really used, uh, you know, in miracles and signs and wonders and things. And when he left the word of faith, he accredited, I think, all of that almost to the devil. That was the devil doing that. And I don't think you... <sighs> okay, this is complicated because there are some groups that are now just now acting absolutely crazy and demonic in especially in africa and they are really affected and influenced by word of faith or at least what we can call the prosperity gospel the, their miracles i am very questioning too I, I would be very careful but these questions that i'm addressing here are from people coming from you know, more classical word of faith groups that are emphasizing the word of God. They are, you know, trying to live lives of holiness as much as they're able. Th those are the groups I'm addressing right here. Okay. I know that there are some subgroups that are, I mean, their kinds of results and miracles. Uh, I, I'm, I, I believe that they are demonic, uh, you know, that they, they are, if they're not just humanly manipulative, uh, they're even demonic. So those, I, I don't even address them here. Okay, I'm, I'm talking about serious Christians who, who are seriously trying to interpret the word of God, living, trying to live holy lives, you know, and those kinds of things. They, they are seriously wrong in some areas, but they are serious. Okay, so that, that's, that's what I'm talking about here. So, yeah, so those kinds of results, I, I, would, not, I would not ascribe them to the devil. I, I wouldn't. Um, even, I mean, laughing or falling or, you, you know, things like that. Um, I recommend a book about just experiencing things of the spirit, like falling down, crying, you know, all these things. I would experience. Uh, I recommend a a book written by a Pentecostal theologian. Uh, his name is Andrew K. Gabriel. I'll put a link in the description. Um, he's written a, a a very easy read book called Simply Simply Spirit Filled, where he deals with some of these uh, you know charismatic uh, experiences and even he deals with a word of faith or what he calls the prosperity gospel it's a very good start to start to think about some of these things uh, charismatic uh, you know experiences that you can put within different interpretational grids or interpretational uh, aspects to them but still keep the, the the focus on the holy spirit and an openness to the life of the spirit and he talks about he he does it with a lot of humor i think you will really enjoy the book but it, it's a it's a good way to start to think about these things that yes i was laughing within the word of faith movement or i fell down in the word of faith meeting uh you know was that the devil no i don't i don't believe that it can be very human some of it is not even spiritual. It's just a human reaction to, you know, sometimes I've been pushed, you know. I fell and that was not God. You know, it was just I fell over. But there are, but if you came with a heart for God, uh, I believe that, that God will, you know, will work in those areas. So, yeah, but we need to think about these things for sure. But I would not be too quick to ascribe them to, to the devil. But I think we need uh, a, a lot of discernments when it comes to these results that we have seen. And, and uh, so many times I think there are gracious answers of prayers from the Lord that we ourselves have put in a wrong narrative or a wrong interpretation to them. So you can just cleanse them from the interpretation, but glorify God for, for what actually happened. So, yeah. Okay, so the third question that was put to me was this, what about the word of faith teachers that I do appreciate and truly enjoy? 
Okay, what about them? What I mean, how can I, the way I interpret that question is how can I, what, what should be my attitude now to these Word of Faith teachers that I appreciate and truly enjoy? Well, we can first of all begin by saying there are some amazing gifts out there I mean, Word of Faith teachers who, who can teach, uh, I mean, they can teach, um, you know, uh, till, first of all, they can teach till the cow comes home and keep your interest, you know? I mean, they, they can teach for a long time and they, they are really, you know, they are good, at, you know, good in rhetorical speech and they have so many gifts. So I understand that we can appreciate and truly enjoy them. So I, I would say, first of all, depends on who. Uh, because again, uh, my understanding of the word of faith is that it has degrees of truth and degrees of darkness depending on the individual. So there are some I would just say hi and goodbye to that definitely are not bringing you further, uh, you know, in your walk with the Lord. And so that doesn't mean we, we just, you know, we, we, we keep. Uh, but but yes, I, so I would uh, I would say that it depends on who we're talking about and, and uh, you know, those kind of things. But then uh, an image that I've been speaking about that has been very helpful to me is the image of hitchhiking that you can hitchhike with them and see that they have taken you from, you know, uh, on one certain direction, but now, uh, you know, it's time to move on, you know. So hitchhiking means that, you, you know, uh, with that image is that you know where you're going. And is this person really taking you further down that road? I mean, really? Uh, if you think so, well, yeah, that's fine then. But if not, well, then it's time to say thank you, you know, and, and move on. So that means taking responsibility for your own faith, right? So and and uh, so I think you should also look at that. That there are many good personality. I mean, there are um, good personalities with bad teachings, right? Uh, so that sometimes it's the personalities that that makes us, you know, really intrigued. Uh, while their teachings are not really helpful. So I think you, you, we should start to kind of differentiate there. Uh, why do I like them? You know, is it just because of personality things, of the way they are and stuff like that? Or is it actually the teachings? I think also we need to be, uh, you know, keep something else in mind. And that is the difference between entertainment value and biblical content. Because much, uh, I mean, some of the great Word of Faith teachers, they are very entertaining too. So how, why do you appreciate them? You know, why do you truly enjoy them? Is it because of their entertainment value? Or is it because of the biblical content that you're getting? Uh, you know, so I think you, you have to have a critical distance to your own appreciation. What is it that you appreciate about them, right? So I think here it's good to take a, a you know a long look in your mirror and see like why do you appreciate them? What is it that you appreciate? Uh, and see that because sometimes it is uh, I think the entertainment value. Uh, sometimes, perhaps more sometimes than the biblical content. And I'm not saying that about the person who asked this question. I'm saying that about my own life and I had to be aware of that. But often it's also the biblical content because Word of Faith teachers are really, really good at putting an emphasis on Scripture. They're unpacking Scripture. I think they're unpacking them uh, somehow wrong, but, that, but they are still having a focus on Scripture. And where else do you find that? I mean, that's not always easy to find. So I understand why we, many people enjoy that, right? So I would say that hold like the uh, critical distance to them as you would do, uh, you know, to your parents. Uh, you know, you identify strengths and weaknesses in your parents. That's part of growing up. That once you reach a certain state of adulthood, you are able to spot the weaknesses in your parents and still love them. And that when you, you become a parent yourself, you, you will love your parents even more because you realize that way, wait a minute here, I, I still have some of these weaknesses and even more, right? But that's part of, you know, growing up is to identify strengths and weaknesses uh, in your parents. So I would hold that, uh, you know, uh, uh, that uh, critical distance uh, to uh, teachers uh, like your parents. So there is that a, a Pentecostal scholar, his name was Walter Hollenweger. He was from Switzerland and he was the first one to really take, uh, you know, spirit filled Christianity, charismatic uh, Pentecostalism seriously and, and really start to do research on it. So Walter Hollenweger uh, grew up Pentecostal, but then later on in life, he transitioned out to, uh, you know, other, uh, uh, what do you call it, Christian kind of, you know, groups. 
uh, still remaining a Christian and very dedicated so. But he, he, they were asking him somehow, why won't you just recant Pentecostalism? You know, uh, wouldn't you just publicly renounce, uh, you know, Pentecostalism? And he had a very interesting reply where he basically said, how can I uh, renounce my mother? You know, uh, the, I, 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 this is where I found faith and this is how I grew up. Uh, you know, and I, I see issues, but how can I renounce my mother? So I, I think having that healthy distance, like this is, um, you know, a response to like your mother uh, that, that brought you into faith. That doesn't mean you still, you know, still live uh, under their uh, <laughs> jurisdictions or in their control in a sense, because uh, any good uh, father or mother wants the children to grow up and take responsibility. So I'm going to come back to this because the fourth question is very, very close to, to this. And you will see that both the third and fourth question will overlap a bit. But I want to speak about something else still about, about the Word of Faith teachers. I will also ask you a, a question like, are they humble or are they prideful? Because the problem in some Word of Faith teachers is an unbroken pride. And I'm not saying that as the most humble person on earth either. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm continuously praying for the Lord to wash me, to cleanse me from pride. And, and uh, so I'm not saying that taking the place of, of the humble guy. I, I'm saying that all of us struggle with areas of pride in different places, but some promote their own pride in a sense. The, a big problem, again, with the word of faith, as I said, is the unbroken ego. And that will make us blind to our own pride, that we become very important. So a preacher that looks at themselves as very important, as, as connecting their interpretation as the truth, as if you really want to get the truth of this, you had to get it from them. Uh, they are taking a way too big place within the Christian faith and that's not a, a healthy place and that's a signal of pride. And where there's pride, there can be a number of other sins that are hidden. So, uh, and I'm not saying that they are sinning willfully or all that. I'm not uh, accusing them. I'm saying that we should be very careful of pride because pride is the beginning of downfall. So, we, we should be, be pride is the territory of the devil. God resists the proud. So I would say be aware of any preacher or teacher who shows signs of pride, whether it be within the word of faith or outside. We you find pre prideful preachers everywhere. All right. So word of faith are definitely not alone. I find some of the strongest critics of the word of faith are very prideful. So I, I think we should. So I, I hope you hear my heart in this. But again, don't I would not uh yeah I would use that as a lens to see is this a a Christ-centered person who tries to be at least at least they try to be humble or are they really self uh are they I mean their ego is so big I mean they they need the double doors to even enter the room you know and are they washing feet or are they actually just uh, taking the platform as a place to to show their own glory and all these kinds of things, I, I think that's uh, a very important question. And I would not sit at the feet of somebody who is is I mean unshamedly prideful, uh, you know. And and last year about the word of faith teachers, I would use and that should be number one. Again, we're talking about being biblical. Of course, they had to be biblical and, and you know all that kind of stuff for sure. But also, how focused on Jesus are they really? You know, how important is Jesus when you and when you leave a session with them? Uh, has your has your love for Jesus been increased, or has your uh, you know your astonishment or your uh, you know your fascination with them? The preacher has that increased what what has increased really right so you know putting the jesus test you know and uh, so i think those are some things i would use uh to to kind of uh challenge why do i enjoy these people why do i appreciate them and and, and so on so and the next question again ties into this so the fourth question is how do i honor those in the word of faith who have helped me hold to truth 
That's a great question. And again, I appreciate the heart from where these questions come from. It, the, this is a heart who's looking for truth, who wants to live honorable and loving and so on. These are questions that I see doesn't come from a, somebody who's bitter and critical and, and just wants to destroy the word of faith and stuff. So I really appreciate these questions. So how do I honor those? I think that's really, really good. I really struggle with this because the, some word of faith personalities have been, were very important to me. Um, they, they, I had their photos on my wall. I mean, they, they, they defined much of what I wanted to be as a, as a believer and as a minister and so on. So how do I honor those? And I was also, that's, I, I, you know, that's where I really took my faith seriously was within the word of faith. So, and I learned a lot that I was very helpful for. So how, how very helpful, they, they were very helpful to me. So how do you go about doing this? Well, let me give you just a few ideas, right? So I, I came to this realization that, first of all, I was really struggling because uh, I thought I was proudful by leaving. All right. So I, I but um, first, I, I would say that what has really helped me uh, was to this insight that I honor them by following their advice. So one advice that I was given by Word of Faith leaders in the early, you know, the early leaders was to eat the hay and leave the straw. Have enough sense as a cow. Eat the hay and leave the straw. Okay, so that means if I critically discern uh, the teachings of the word of faith, and critically I mean just you know sorting out what's biblical and what's not, then I'm following their advice. Even if it ends up that I throw away some stuff that they think is hay and I will label it as straw. I am following their advice. So I honor them even though I don't follow their teachings anymore. I follow their intentions. They also, in Word of Faith, the classical Word of Faith at least, focus on the Word of God. That means that the early teachers were saying, don't take my word for it. Search the Scriptures. So if I search the Scriptures, finding that the Word of Faith is wrong in this area, and I'm moving into this area instead, then I'm following their advice and I'm actually honoring them. So I'm not honoring them by accepting their teachings, I'm honoring them by following their advice to take the word as number one authority. So I'm still in that sense honoring them because I put the word first. That's exactly what they told me to do. Even though that would put me in a different journey, in a different trajectory, I'm still following that advice of putting the word first. That way I can still honor them and I can be still very thankful to those Word of Faith teachers to, who told me to, to think critically and to put the Word of God before any other human being. I'm very thankful for those things, right? So the last thing also about honoring the, in the, this situation, right, by following their advice, is that if I show the same commitment to what I believe as the commitment they have to what they believe, I'm also honoring them. So I can be inspired by how committed they are to their beliefs. And I can honor them by being equally committed to my beliefs, to what I believe is truly biblical. All right. So I think those are some ways I honor my, my, you know, the people that taught me early on in the word of faith. So I follow their ethos or their culture in a sense without keeping to their results. So I also pray for them. Uh, you know, that's a way of honoring. I pray for God's blessing for those who are alive still. I pray that God will bless them and open their eyes and things like that. I also honor them by dispelling misunderstandings about them. So there are so much, I think there are many misunderstandings and even lies about some of these main word of faith guys. And, and I think one way of honoring them is to dispel the misunderstandings. I said, it's not true. What you're saying about them being that this main leader is, he was selfish. He was just teaching this for his own private gain. And they are just, uh, you know, demonic or, spirit, you know, all these. So I think even though I'm not, you know, you hear me that I'm, I'm still having issues with the word of faith. I still want to dispel some of those caricatures and some of those lies, actually, that are out there. These are just new age guys hungry for more money. Well, that's that's a stereotypical, uh, you know, that's wrong. That's not true about the main center people, what, what I found. So you can still dispel misunderstandings even without following them. So I think that's a way I, I can see that I can still honor them. And also... Um, Using the word of hitchhiking there to see that no one can take you where you need to go. And so I honor them by also saying goodbye to them because only Jesus can take me to my final destination and they will agree. 
no human being can take me to the final destination. So yeah, I would I would go ahead and, and continue, you know, my road the way the Lord has led me now. That's a way to honor them. And I, I just I was serving under a very influential pastor uh, within the word of faith. And uh, then I, I left and then I met him just very recently, a couple of years ago, when I was finishing my PhD work on the Word of Faith movement. And he knows that I have changed very differently or drastically. And he came up to me and he said something very interesting. He says, uh, Michael, do what God has told you to do. And he, he walked off and he didn't do it bitterly. Somehow in it, I sensed a respect that you you need to do what God has told you to do. And I want, I keep on doing what I have discerned is the will of God. And again, I respect that because at the end of the day, the Lord will come back and we will know which one was more biblical or not. Right. But I, so there's that, uh, you know, that you can, that I felt that he, he, he even honored me back for following the same trajectory and the, the, the commitment to truth and the commitment to being led by God, even though we ended up in very different directions going, you know, on the way, on the way going. So anyway, yeah. So, and just, uh, there's so much I want to speak about, but uh, I don't know. So I just want to touch on, on the myth of the spiritual fathers because, or the spiritual mothers, because in the word of faith is that idea that you need to be, you know, connected to a spiritual father or mother and that the anointing flows through them to you. And that's a myth. That's not the biblical. Jesus even said, don't, don't call anyone father. Why? Because at the you will always outgrow your spiritual leaders uh, hopefully so, so that that's the, the that you will always look to god as your father only and you do, you do not tie your spiritual progress to an individual never tie your spiritual progress to an individual okay uh, let them inspire you let them help you but it's only the lord who will take you where you need to go because okay so let me go to the fifth question because time is running out here but the fifth question is very important also where do i go from here okay so this is a guy coming out of the word of faith being a leader within the word of faith uh his whole life he's been there and now he recognized that he needs to move on what do you do well first of all let me just say uh that this is uh i i i congratulate the 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 boldness and the courage to even come this far so i would say first of all congratulations and and also be kind to yourself right because transitioning worldviews or transitioning a theological beliefs is 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 a very vulnerable time also very difficult because you will re you will rethink so many things you will question so many things and these are things that are so dear and so deep in you that they also take a lot of energy mental spiritual physical energy uh there are so many things uh, that are happening at the same time and you become very vulnerable so give yourself time and but uh, feel the the you know the appreciation or the the encouragement from this side and the love uh, to even dare to do this uh, i mean that that takes true faith so moving on takes faith true faith in god because you know what you have but you don't know what you what's ahead of you so you have to be you know you feel like you're losing something in the beginning and you will uh you, you know like i i was speaking to my wife about this and like how can we address these questions and she she said something i found very wonderful she said tell them that you will not lose because the devil is right there to lie to us and say that you know, if you're leaving the word of faith, you will actually lose. You will lose so much. But I don't know anybody that has left the word of faith that has ever gone back. I, I, I left a moment of pause there for, for dramatic effect, <laughs> if you notice. Well, I don't, and, I will, and even I repeat for rhetorical effect, I don't know anybody who has left the word of faith because they spotted theological problems in the worldview going into another Christian's better interpretation of things who has ever gone back fully into the word of faith. I don't see that. Why? Because you will not lose. There are great riches, amazing riches ahead of you. So uh, I can honestly say that there are so many riches, amazing experiences with God, riches of his word and of, his, of the world of God, not just the word of God, but the world of God. So amazing wealth and riches there for us in, in our life with God, in the spirit that I would never go back for a million dollars. 
So the, you will never lose. Don't listen. If the devil is lying to you that you will lose things, you will not lose. There are new friends. There are new. There are new. There are new connections. There are there are other doors. There are new opportunities. So God will, you know. But it takes a risk. Faith takes a risk, and the risk is to move out from where you're comfortable into a new place. And that means relearning a lot of things, rethinking a lot of things. Uh, and that takes a risk, and it takes faith, and it takes sacrifice. You had to sacrifice for that but it's worth the sacrifice and you do it for the lord you know uh, because you believe the lord has led you on this journey so you, it takes sacrifice but also give yourself time like i said you know don't be uh in a rush uh, give yourself time to digest give yourself time uh you know and move uh, as the lord leads you i would also encourage you of course and this is a given but i had to say it anyway pray keep praying that the holy spirit who's the spirit of truth will guide you into all truth Keep on praying and you will see amazing things. You will see how God sends people across your path at a time when you need them. God will send books. God will send YouTube clips. God will send podcasts. God will send a sermon. God will send, you know, uh, a letter in the mail. He would do things, that a phone call. You know, he would send things across your path you didn't even know existed. He will open doors. And I believe I'm prophesying. He will open doors you do not know even exist right now he would do that in answer to prayer as you keep on praying lord lead me into truth lead me to truth i want nothing but you jesus i want nothing but you holy spirit who are you you who are the spirit of truth guide me lead me you know and when you pray that you will see amazing things i could spend podcast upon podcast of speaking about how amazingly god in miraculous ways often have led us into new areas of insight and truth oh man so god is so good in answer to prayer of course i would say study i don't know how you appreciate the word study some people feel that it's it's a demand a command a heavy burden but jesus said you know his burden is light but he said also come and learn come and learn from me so studying is not a heavy yoke uh, it's an easy yoke. It's a yoke of, of light, of life, right? And when you say study, some people think reading thick books. If you like reading thick books, there are great thick books out there, all right? If you don't know any, let me know. I'll recommend a few. But uh, you might not need to read thick books. If you don't like reading, you can, you know, get materials for other ways. You can, you know, listen, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, podcasts, of course, or you can listen to uh, audio books. You can listen to YouTube. Uh, you know, there's so many ways of getting new insights uh, into historical biblical Christianity all right so study study you know and study some of these issues I mentioned before focus on Jesus and the Holy Spirit I think those are some of the two main weaknesses in the word of faith I would begin by Jesus that's a good start you know uh, and uh, continue studying scripture emerge yourself in scripture get to know the voice of God through the word of God you know and, and you know because so much is, has been filtered through the word of faith worldview that you need to re relearn scripture in so many ways and specifically read places that you haven't read before you know that you didn't have to spend much time in read them by the help of good commentaries or things like that and know the big you know story of scripture that you know and get those resources that i mentioned in other podcasts and stuff like that and also get to know biblical doctrine uh you know uh, enter into dialogue you know uh you know and and, and learn you know the the big the most important doctrines or dogmas uh you know with with uh you know, some some good help. One good introduction would be the Pentecostal systematic theologian Frank Macchia's introduction to theology. I put a link, uh, and uh, it's a good start. It's a bit of an academic work, but it's not hard at all. Anybody can read it, uh, and I would recommend that as a good start to think through some of the doctrines. That's a good way to keep on uh, in the area of doctrine. Um, and also the last few points here, and then we'll end. But that's to talk, find people to talk to. Uh, talk, uh, you know, talk with your spouse or a good friend. If you, if it's you, if you're married, spend time talking with your spouse about these things, so that you do the journey together. My wife and I, we did the journey together. I'm so thankful for that. But find people to talk to. Do not do it on your own. You cannot transition worldviews just on your own usually. Uh, you know, you do it together in a group. So I would definitely find people to talk to, find people to, to you know, ask questions and back and forth. And sometimes you, you just, just by talking about them, God will speak to you and help you to move further. So speak, talk, you know, 
And, and then last but not least, uh, don't try to convert everybody else, <laughs> all right? You are in a process, right? So when the moment you see a truth, you want everybody else to see it, but everybody are in different places in our journeys, uh, you know? So discern who you talk to. And if you have a good friend still within the Word of Faith, they might not be ready now. You know, be, le be led by the Spirit here. When is a good time to share it and when is not? When is a good time to, you know, open up about your own journey? And when is a good time just to be, you know, quiet and pray for them? So uh, that's my last point. Don't, you don't have to be a zealot trying to convert everybody else. So those were my responses to these questions. I hope you have found them helpful. Please reach out to me. If you have other questions, let me know. And until I see you in other upcoming podcasts and videos, God bless you.